Yeah, maybe yeah. you can say something about that. Do you want to sit in the middle? Or you no. Why did I choose? I, I can sit. I don't know. Whoa, this is no, no, no. Go over there. It's fine. Yeah. Oh, I got my name in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, all right. Welcome, everyone, to the World If panel. <laughs> um, Originally, I had called this panel Community, Memory, and Computers, a roundtable discussion on the weathering of social structures by technology and vice versa. And when I was talking with my colleague, Keaton, he was like, that's pretty broad. You could probably just call it the world if. <laughs> and it's true, this topic is really broad, but we've seen like what's happened with you know, centralization prevailing with social technology. And it feels right now like we're at you know, the precipice of a paradigm shift where we can really question anything and everything about social technology. So this panel is meant to kind of answer the question of, you know, what's happening with technology and communities today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Um, so we have some great panelists with us. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Um, some of you might notice that we don't have Simon Denny here. He unfortunately could not make it, but we are very grateful to have Matt Condon here. Yeah, um, some of you might recognize him. He's been around the Urban Network for a long time, has touched some of your beloved technology bridge. Yeah, right? bridge. Um, <laughs> beloved. Very beloved. Hate, <laughs> hated. Um, but uh, also most notably of Pleaser Dow. You might have also seen him on the slopes, and he also has a chip in his hand. So when you meet him, you can mint an NFT, proof of meeting Matt, and if that's not social technology, <laughs> I don't know what is. Um, and then next we have Ellie Hain, um, and she is the co-founder of the Institute for Meaning Alignment, a research organization working to ensure the human flourishing in the age of AGI. Um, they have a unique expertise in human values and meaning, which they apply to AI alignment, crafting future narratives, and community building. So thanks, Ellie. Thank and then lastly, we have Jose, who works at the intersection of community and technology and has pioneered niche, niche you know, community software at Friends with Benefits and also even like community-owned personalities at Bread yeah. with little Michaela. Yeah. Um, and then if you don't know me, I'm Marissa. I work at Talon, um, somewhere at the intersection of product and community. Um, uh, intersections. So oh, yeah. Intersections up here. It's, yeah, it's all intersectional. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we had dinner at the intersection yeah, of food and art yesterday. Me. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So I figured we'd just start out with a, a little, like, scene check. Like, are the kids all right? Are the communities <laughs> all right today? we can just kind of go down the line. Uh, Jose, do you want to take the lead? I mean, uh, wh which communities are we talking about? All communities, my community, right? Kids, yeah. in general, kids. No, is, I is, mean... is, is anyone actually okay these days? I, I think like, that's a loaded question you're asking. Real talk. How's, how's FWB doing these days? Uh, FWB right now is, um, you know that thing where if you grew up in an abusive household but your parents still feed you, you're like not sure how to react sometimes? Oh my Anyone gosh. else understand that analogy? It's kind of like that. <laughs> like people are not okay, but things are also generally probably just fine. Like you'll just need a lot of expensive therapy down the line. Mm. Right. Wow. So the technology right now is maybe like messing up the kids, but we'll figure out how to deal with it later. I got to be honest. I don't know if it's the technology. I think it's the people that are the problem. <laughs> mm. Snaps. All right. <laughs> now, All are right. the kids like the kids growing up or the kids who are, you're talking about FWB, the people are just like organizing online? What do you? I, I think, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to think about that. Okay. Yeah. I'm still in the moment where I'm in my room listening to Slipknot and crying. <laughs> That's awesome. Those were the good days. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ellie, how are your communities doing? <laughs> how are the kids these days? I mean, so the kids that hang out in our community, we don't have a DAO, so there's that. Maybe they're not okay for that reason. So on, smart. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, though, we do have, like, meaning in our name meaning alignment. So that sort of like guarantees that people at least are going to be like somehow okay. And actually in reality, like everyone's 
everyone's thriving, you know, masterized in their lane, like living their best, meaning max life in our immediate community. So that's, so that's sort of beautiful. That said, if you step out, even just like two steps um, beyond our community, the kids are not that okay. Being honest, you know, you have like people in cities, like my, some of my other friends, just like living for the hustle, or you know, like part of our work is in San Francisco. And like the meeting community is fine, but <laughs> San Francisco is just not, <laughs> not okay in so many ways. Um, or you know, like my younger cousins, you know, they have like TikTok and they're like super stressed about like what are they gonna do with their careers and is the world ending and it's like climate change. So, you know, culture at large seems like it's not okay, but that presents a good opportunity for like niche communities to, you know, hook them up with, in our case, meaning, but, you know, there might be some other goods around. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great way to put it. Uh, if you have community, it's insulation against yeah. everything else that's happening right now. Yeah, with perhaps exception of communities that have a token, because that seems to be, even if you try to insulate from the financial uh, context, it's still that, that bear market vibe seems to permeate, and it doesn't matter how many times you and your community say, oh, we don't care about the token price, it's, it's still relevant, um, which seems like a, I don't know, kind of a difficult thing to, to get over in a very crypto-financialized uh, substrate that we're in. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And we were kind of talking about some of that the other night where yeah. it's like, I, what, yeah, like a social DAO, for example, mm -hmm. isn't immune to it, but there's also plenty of DAOs that just started because of the token and found themselves like, mm -hmm. totally. who are we? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm kind of curious how maybe like Pleaser is experiencing some of that right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, financial incentives crowd out, right? If you inject money into any system, suddenly the game you were playing before is necessarily different. Um, and that might be kind of a non-starter for a lot of communities online. I think PleaserDAO uh, as a specific org, if anyone has context, their natural environment is the NFT bull market uh, where they take millions of dollars and buy NFTs, most of which goes to charities and they have a good time doing it. Um, they're like DeFi people from the previous, previous bull run. Um, and that worked. That really worked. Um, and obviously, PleaserDAO doesn't have a free-floating token, so we luckily don't have to deal with a lot of that. But, um, you know, it is a financialized community in some sense. And so because of that, yeah, you have the, the oppression of bear market happening to the vibes, which... I don't know, it seems like almost a non-starter if you're trying to build a community that is, you know, able to weather, is not, you just don't want it to be connected to the financial system at all. Um, that's what a community, you know, almost definitionally is. Uh, if you're connected to the financial system, maybe you're more like a market, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it seems to be a difficulty with online, especially crypto communities, is this um, sort of inalienable, connection to the financial system and the larger context. I don't know. Um, what, what do people talk about when there's nothing to buy? Honestly, they talk about other things that they might want to buy. Uh, oh, like, really? like Islands was the most recent one. I don't know if anyone follows the island auction market, but there was a pretty cool island off the coast of uh, New York. And um, ridiculous thing. It wasn't oh. Rat Island, was it? What's that? The island that's overrun with rats? No, I hope not. If okay. so, that would have explained the price it sold for. Makes sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, people just riffing, like, haha, what if we bought this? What if we bought this restaurant in, uh, you know that uh, fucking diner on the corner of, like, Grand and something in yeah. uh, New York? It's the <laughs> Kellogg's Diner. Yeah. Um, you, that was up for sale, and they were like, what if we bought that? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it call, the bear market happening calls into question, like, what, yeah, exactly, what are we? What are we doing? It, it asks the hard question of, like, does what we were doing, was it a temporal thing? Um, and that's actually something we could talk about is temporality and, like, should communities exist forever? Because the assumption is that everything you're building today is going to exist forever. Is that necessarily the case? Shouldn't things have end dates? Shouldn't things have, like, it's okay if this DAO doesn't go past the next two years, that was maybe its purpose. 
Um, no one's asking those questions. Everything is supposed to be on chain forever and, pers and just like the vibes will keep going forever. There's no end. And that seems really um, self-defeating almost mm -hmm. because yeah. since yeah. when has that been true? Yeah, it well, seems like... Go for it. <laughs> it seems like people are trying to build DAOs to have community instead of like building community and the, the DAO comes mm -hmm. after. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, building community is very hard, but making a DAO is very easy, um, especially when you leverage the you know, crypto bull market of whichever you know, year you're in. Um, it's a shortcut for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it seems like the, there's like a mismatch between the technology and the community, right? The technology is meant to last forever, but communities are always kind of in flux, right? And redefining themselves based on who's entering, yeah. who's exiting. I'm kind of curious, Jose, how you're seeing that with a very like, Pleaser DAO is much more like, I think economically focused, asset focused. Yeah. And like FWB really started out <laughs> with friends, so like, do you yeah. have any insulation from that with a social DAO? Um, I think that the, like, the core nature of FWB, once it's scaled past like, the initial 100 folks who were brought in by the initial like, five to seven folks that started it, some of whom were in this room, it's like, people arguing about what FWB is. And <laughs> it's just that that argument about what FWB is has changed every time we've added another like 150 to 200 people. And so now that we're at roughly like 4,000-ish inside of the Discord, which doesn't even count the other 3,000 that are just token holders who show up to our events, like the, the debate about what it is is like um, both all the more interesting and also all the more pointless because by this point, there's enough subgroups that have their own view on what the community is that it almost fundamentally doesn't matter if we ever define the top line, in my opinion. I often get asked, like, well, what is FWB, especially when I'm in rooms of people who don't know what DAOs are, don't know what crypto is, and uh, I, like, try to explain it, and I fail every single time, but that, to me, is actually a sign of success. Um, I've always felt like the second that you nail down a description for, like, FWB is a community that does blah, blah, blah. Like, that's the moment where the thing dies. Totally. Um, the same way that, like, the second that a, a music genre becomes definable and commodifiable and you understand the edges, it becomes something that ends up on mood boards and then sold back to you by a corporation. Totally. So I, I much prefer FWB remaining this, like, slippery, difficult to define, sometimes painful to talk about thing, mm. because that to me means that it's alive, that it has this energy that can like morph and change over time and continue to push it forward. Yeah, it reminds me of like some of what like uh, the autonomous worlds guys say about kind of like infinite gameplay. Mm. Um, yeah, you, you want a game where the rules always are shifting, because uh, otherwise it's finite and it's quite dull. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, like kind of, kind of relatedly, we were emailing back and forth before this panel, and you're like, "Sorry to to get back to you late. Like it was my birthday, <laughs> and like all of my friends came over, and you know we ended up using this tool that we created at Meaning Alignment, um, and it sounded almost as if like Chat GPT was not only a guest but like." the host of your yeah. birthday party well, organizing we're co -hosting. games? Yeah, me and Chad Jipati. So I'm like wondering if you can tell us a little <laughs> bit more about what, what that is and, and yeah, how it worked. Yeah, sure, sure. So I think this ties with something that was like coming up as, as you guys were speaking, that you know, when we talk about community, like what is community really? And I think nowadays, Digital communities have like definitely like important component of like the definition of, of community, but I think if you stay in like the digital realm only, you're missing out on honestly like the best stuff, right? It's yeah, it's like a very limited definition of community. So what me and and my team at the Institute for Meaning Alignment have been doing is we uh, we built this tool. Um, it's like a meaning fine tuned version of ChatGPT where you can create a, a common space and then you have like your friends, a community, like whoever you invite to use it. And the first screen basically, um, it asks for people about a meaningful experience that you had in community, maybe in, like it was my birthday. So in that case, it was a meaningful experience that they had with me, but it can be really any meaningful experience. And um, ChatGPT, as I'm sure you all know, is very smart. 
So it asks you a lot of follow-up questions, and what it's trying to do is like trying to get at the sort of like core like value or like core essence of what made a particular experience meaningful. And with that, we create um, basically it's like a data format that we call like a value or a source of meaning that like really represents a, yeah like the blurb of meaning behind any experience. So with that, we create a, a meaning profile for each person, and then you're in a group. So after that, you get uh, you can ask ChatGPT for recommendations, and then you get matched with people in the group to do um, cool things together. So yeah, that's a cool tool for DAOs too. That's but it's awesome. also cool doing doing it in like doing it live with a group of people in the same context, because then you kind of like you can provide a beautiful framing. In that case, it was like a ritual right. um, uh, around God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you have people do that. Then everyone can see their values, each other's values, which is in itself like a very beautiful experience. And then you get matched, and you can, you know, you can schedule even in in the app. So that's pretty cool. That's cool for the community and the group itself as a as a shared experience. But it also helps with AI alignment because we're basically using all this data to create a, a graph of values that then we use to train ChatGPT wow. to become wiser. That's really awesome. Yeah, it's cool. Um, it's not live yet, so not everyone can use it. But if you want to use it, you can come to me, and I'll send you a private link. Cool. Wow. Yeah, that, that makes me think about just like what, like what are the <coughs> platforms we're using today mm -hmm. to like connect, and what's what you know like what facilitates that type of like cultural production. Mm -hmm. Um, like one of the questions that uh, like a friend sent me for this panel was like, uh, what what would cultural production be like today without with different tools? Like right now, um, the way you interact with ChatGPT like kind of pushes you in a certain direction. Same with Instagram, Twitter, mm -hmm. yeah. TikTok, medium whatever. Is the yeah. yeah, medium is the message exactly. <laughs> uh, and so I'm curious kind of like what you're seeing in your <laughs> communities, whether it's like, yeah, NFT production or... Totally. Well, I think Discord is, is the shittiest medium in the world for a community, right? Like Slack, Discord, all of this. It's kind of been talked about to death, but like, yeah, the medium is the message. And like Discord is not a, an accurate skeuomorphic understanding of how humans want to interact in the world physically and or digitally. And it just feels... Uh, yeah, it feels like such a digitally specific product, and for that reason feels, I don't know, perhaps kind of alienating or inhumane. Um, and I don't know, maybe all of technology is kind of like that, because what humans probably want most of is more of this IRL stuff, but mm -hmm. transmuted or translated digitally. Um, but that seems to be in difficult and or impossible to design. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it seems to be a rather open question. Why haven't we seen more UIs that are, you know, not, not explicitly three-dimensional, but like spatial, certainly, mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, w what's up with that? And I don't know, maybe related to how humans want to interact. Yeah, I mean, I think, Jose, you're specifically like working on this question right now, because I believe like FWB started out very online, because it was like in the days of like COVID and also yeah. like some of the NFT bull market. Um, and then obviously like COVID ended and suddenly everyone was like, oh, we can hang out again. And so there's been this big shift for FWB and you're specifically too working on a product that yeah. hopes to kind of like merge or help with that sort of like digital to IRL engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um it's interesting because I think that one of the, the kind of like core pieces of FWB has always been this like willingness to gather together in person. Um, and I think that things that we've done offline have driven the most success for us as a community. Like we, the first party we threw had a line of like 250 really fucking weird people at Bitcoin Miami trying to buy our token to get into this nightclub. That led to us creating this product called Gatekeeper, which was a way for us to allow people to RSVP to the event based on whether or not they had certain kinds of tokens in their wallet because we realized there's no solution for what we're trying to do here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
we have a festival that we throw for a thousand people each year that has become this kind of like marquee event for our community and other communities in the Web3 space to come to to kind of showcase like what they're working on, what they're interested in, what's next for them. Um, and then we did a experiment that I would consider a great learning experience, but that didn't quite hit the right mark that we're talking about, which is we did build this like micro social network uh, that was just called the FWB app. And quite frankly, it was just a feed that you could only access if you were in the community, which um, I, I'm always surprised by how many people I would run into who would show me that the app was like on their home screen and that they would like, they felt it was like cozy and safe, which um, I think what you were saying earlier is interesting because uh, innovations and explorations around like what UIs can deliver for people are very important and I think there's some interesting experiments to be done there. but. Like text communi communication is one of the most durable forms of interaction we've had using interfaces for the last 60 years. And I think there's even things in that area that could be improved upon that we haven't seen yet. Mm. Um, but the other thing that quite frankly matters a lot, and this is something that I think uh, like Talon and companies working in the urban ecosystem understand really well, which is like who's building the thing for you really matters. Your sense of connection to them actually dictates in a lot of ways how you end up feeling about those interfaces when you're using them. Um, and your ability to kind of wrap your head around like, and trust that uh, the reason why they're building it is something that you feel like you can kind of get, get on board with. Totally. Yeah. 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 That aesthetic feeling of how, the, which platform you're using and how you're using it is, is relevant to the actual connection that's happening. Absolutely. Like, yeah, Galen was saying. Awesome. Yeah, maybe to say something to like your original question, Marisa. I think it's interesting how like the default path of technology, um, even good technology, is to be like inherently like alienating. And so right now, at least um, in AI, which is where I work, I'm not a crypto person. Um, what means like good aligned AI? It's still like the paradigm of like one model is aligned to one user, mm -hmm. right? And so the utopian vision it even looks like her. Right? So you have like your AI best friend that like it really understands you and it like helps you grow and like provides connection, but like is that really utopian? Right? But that's that's a default paradigm. And so kind of like what we're trying to bring in is this vision of like what if models were aligned like not just to one user, but to communities, right? And then like to communities and to kind of like the entire social fabric. In the end, this is just like a question of metrics. And I think the reason why this doesn't doesn't happen is because we don't know. We don't know well how to define that, and we don't know well how to define like the metrics that align to community. But I think this is one of the, you know, biggest challenges in in tech. Even in, you can see in in like traditional social media companies, when they define what's good, like in, in Facebook, and when they try to kind of like, oh, now we're gonna do something good for the community, their good is like privacy, which like okay, privacy is important, but who gets like really excited by privacy? <laughs> like, no one, you know, like privacy is mostly like a cope for like, we can't get the thing that we really want, so at least we're going to be private. Um, and there's this sort of like lack of like truly like inspiring and exciting visions for what technology could be. And I think that's why we get trapped in this like, oh, we're going to have like, you know, privacy or even in many cases, I think a DAO, right, is, is not that exciting, but it's, it's what we can manage. Yeah, it, it's interesting to think about like technologies that help us better to coordinate and specifically, right, like there's the panel on sovereign AI, it was very focused on yeah. a personal AI. It's really interesting when you start to think about, yeah, community governance and, and using AI. We were talking earlier too about um, like what happens when you have a community that has a mandate that suddenly like changes against its mandate, right? Mm. Um, we're talking about specifically in the context of like governance, right, where for example, I don't know, Pleaser Dow might have, have be like, this is one of our values, and then everyone votes to do something that you're like, that, that we literally stated that's not our value. So I, I don't know how we're like thinking about that sort of kind of governance and sense making in our communities. Well, I literally never thought about the application of AI to this like generalized problem of governance um, because that's actually really interesting because um, that's one of the generalized issues with all of these uh, online communities in general, but also specifically DAOs is the, the meta game of coming to cohesion or a collective understanding of something is um, inefficient perhaps, uh, not well designed, or I don't know, it's all, I don't know, if you've ever been part of a DAO, you know what I mean. Um, 
but that would be quite interesting to see uh, some of this be, I don't know, this fuzziness perhaps be encouraged by AI where, I don't know, certain ideas or things like, I don't know, I'm still thinking about this because I'd never had this thought before, but that's really interesting, yeah. yeah. Any thoughts, Jose? Um, <clears throat> because I mentioned Slipknot earlier, the song People Equal Shit is like, <laughs> right now. Um, I don't know, I feel like, let's zoom out a bit, right? Like, let's go outside of DAOs, let's just talk about communities more broadly and like, mm -hmm. think of the things that you've belonged to, like maybe the community that you encountered, at the various levels of school that you might have gone to. Uh, maybe you happen to have a community in your actual neighborhood, although I think those are uh, like a, a psyop that doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. Um, neighborhood? <laughs> I, I think that like communities are by nature really chaotic and strange beasts. And mm -hmm. I think that often what happens when we talk about them in the context of like technology is that we want them to be much more streamlined and simple yeah. and sensical than they actually are. Totally. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know, the, the whole thing that you mentioned earlier, Marissa, about like people voting against mm -hmm. sort of like accepted values that you're supposed to adhere to when you join a thing, or even quite frankly, voting against their best interests. Like, people do that all the fucking time. Mm -hmm. And that may not necessarily be a bug, that might be a feature, right? Totally. Like that might just be the way that people are wired. It's hard to keep track of your daily life and keep track of every single discussion that's happened inside of a shitty platform that isn't <laughs> meant for people to have nuanced yeah. discussions about things in. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, I think that like, one of the things that often gets lost when we talk about community and technology is that <laughs> most of the people who build software for communities don't have friends to begin with, right? Like it's, it's like people who don't have a connection to like that many people to help them understand what it's like to have more than like five or six people to interact with. Mm. And so it all becomes this like tunnel vision of like, yes, the people come in and then they talk and they debate and then they find consensus naturally and then it goes to this other tool where like the proposal is and people vote on it. And it's like, totally. that's not how shit happens in the real totally. world. Uh, yeah, is yeah, that the yeah. dilemma? The protocolization of how communities interact is necessarily at odds with like the weird black boxes that are humans all coming together and doing like just being somewhat in a community but not really and knowing part of the thing but not really and having, you know, agreeing 80% today with the uh, stated values of the community, but like 20%, like they also want it to be something else. Like all of it's so fuzzy, but the nature of technology is to constrain and to protocolize. And certainly if the people who are building it are such that they have programmer brain, yeah. uh, you're gonna get even more of that. Totally. Yeah, this reminds me of this banger tweet that I saw that is the guy who has never hosted a dinner party. I'm gonna start a network state <laughs> for a DAO. Um, and I think this does say a lot, like usually when I, I, I do get invited sometimes to hang out with like very like online communities or like on communities that are online first. And maybe I should not say this live, but honestly, the experience is often jarring. Mm. Like you can really see why, why a lot of people like choose to retreat online and it's mostly as a you know, like cover from the real world. And it, that's, not, that's not really utopian, is it? Mm. So I think, you know, when you're doing these like sort of like experimentation, I do think that like online communities are like a promising avenue for the future. Mm. But I think like the playground for experimentation and like prototyping should happen in real life. Mm -hmm. And then you get this kind of like much more fluid understanding of like human nature, how do people actually like to come together and like, you know, make decisions and like do governance and so on and so on. And then you can export these mm. to an online community after, once you have something that is actually working in real life. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a, what is it, the desire lines way of building a community, yeah. basically. Totally. Um, I'm kind of curious though, as we're saying this, right, like communities, naturally chaotic, potentially there's a path to build technology for these communities by starting in person and like mapping out those dynamics and making technology for, for that community. Like, what does that end up looking like? Do we end up with something like the everything app Mm. Or do we end up with something that's more modular with a bunch of like different um, specific purpose built small applications? Yeah, I don't know, especially I think all, mm. all of you have a very interesting view on this. <laughs> I love the idea of tailored personalized software. 
um, but it does seem to be uh, difficult. There's always that spectrum of specificity and hard work required to get there and generalization, but the generalized product doesn't necessarily fit what you want. And there seems to be a, a truism about that uh, spectrum. Um, but I would love to see hypermodular, hyper-specific, like the FWB app for FWB, like that is, that is awesome. And that's why it's cozy, because it's hyper-specific, hyper-modular. Uh, you have the built-in assumption that anyone using the app is also in FWB, which is massive. And there's also the aesthetic like structure of, it's not a website, it is an app or a PWA, whatever. But that, that aesthetic difference is important for how someone relates to the software. And to use a platform is to be mediated, and that necessarily uh, detracts from coziness or yeah. intimacy and stuff like that. And so I would love to see a world in which there's hyper-specific, um, hyper-user-focused. You can build an app as a home-cooked meal, right? As Robin Sloan likes to say, you can build an app for yourself on a weekend, and it doesn't need to go anywhere else. Um, it's just that that's difficult. Um, and be, yeah, building apps is hard, and so um, yeah, I see the I see the duality there of yeah, but would love to see hyper specific uh, community apps or software. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I I don't know about the question in general, but I can tell you how we in particular think about these, and I think for us. Modularity is an important component, but how we how we envision this modularity is in having like community-owned, like fine-tuned models, like LLMs that have like a really good understanding of the, what the community wants, cool. and then uses that understanding to sort of like match people and kind of like suggest activities. And at some point, we even believe that like this could evolve into some sort of. Um, not just that the community owns the model, but like the model even has some assets. So you can like buy in maybe first with just a membership, but then maybe you can even like buy with like some assets, whether that's like, you know, crypto or stocks or like real estate even. And then the model uses that like pool of assets to even kind of like build the community. Um, yeah, and I think that maybe kind of like tying to one of the themes that we touched on before and like the inherent tendency for like technology to atomize, that's not just like technology, that's like markets in general. So kind of like how the whole like capitalist structure is, is set up, even in its ideal form, is that like everyone gets their preferences like maximally satisfied by like consuming products like mostly on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also kind of like the blueprint, not just for kind of like a new paradigm of technology, but for a new economic paradigm, where like we're not just like trying to satisfy all of our needs in isolation, but rather we understand that like a core human need is really like community and belonging and kind of like sharing and enjoying together life with our friends and, and loved ones and beyond. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, you know, how we're trying to both, so, you know, mm -hmm. tackle some of like the alignment questions, but also not just AI, but market alignment questions. Mm -hmm. How important was it for your, um, your previous ChatGPT experiment to have an offline IRL uh, component, like, at your party? Yeah, I, I think very, very important in different ways. So we've been sort of creating community for the past, like, I don't know, depends, depends on where you, where you start counting, sure. right? But um, at least five years, and it was always very informal. Mm -hmm. I guess kind of like at the beginning, like most of my friends and people who like know about what we're doing that you know, feel attracted to it, and then they also end up becoming my friends. Yeah. It's funny because you know, one of the people that you, you, uh, we were working with, uh, he was telling us that why is our, everyone in our organization is best friends, that we should like, get some like, external people from the outside to make it more professional. <laughs> and I was like, they end up becoming our best friends too. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's awesome. So I think these, um, it sort of happened like organically, but when you create like a strong, like cultural, like gravitational pool, um, these just informs the, the things that you build and how you start testing. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, at, at first I was just because that's like the default. I was eager to like do online experiments first, mm -hmm. but my co-founder was like, no. You know, mm -hmm. he used to do. He was a CTO for couchsurfing, so he really understood the importance of. Mm -hmm. IRL experiences first, and then as as I got more comfortable in doing that, I would yeah never go back totally. to online first. Yeah, the best yeah. things like for community that Pleaser DAO has done involve IRL events. Just like there's something about 
obviously you get something with online. Please it out wouldn't exist without online financialized crypto vibe curation situation. But like, it's not real until you meet up IRL. And maybe there's you know just expansion and contraction. But it feels like the IRL component. You were saying this with FWB, right? Like the the parties, the events. These are these are core to the community. Um, but clearly something is gained by the online. Yeah, I think tra traversing both and being able to move back and forth fluidly, I think is really important. And I think like, I don't know, when people talk about like metaverses and shit like that, it's like, I'm much more interested in a world where what that means is the ability to socialize with groups of people online and off in a way that feels a lot more seamless and interconnected. Mm. The thing that did come to mind as you were talking is uh, also that um, one concern that I have that so far hasn't come true when it comes to FWB and our in-person events is like, <clears throat> it's really easy to put on a performance when you're at these things in person, right? Like people are on their best behavior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of the things I, I kind of um, think about is like, you know, in FWB and in many online communities that I've been a part of, there's like the folks who are either like super kind in person and like really fucking weird online or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's another thing that we don't really account for when we're talking about community and technology and like now the IRL component, which is that um, people are different depending on how they're being mediated to totally. use your, totally. your reference. People are different based on what's going on in their lives. People are different based on like the makeup of who's in the room with them, who they're interacting with, et cetera. Um, and that's another kind of like deeper aspect of being in community with others that technology so far hasn't been able to um, deal with appropriately. And so what you end up with is people being like, I hate that fucking person. They're like a shithead online that are always trolling me. And then someone else is like, no, I hung out with them and they bought me a sandwich when I needed it and they were so nice. And like, yeah. that to me is magical and special and like worth preserving. Mm -hmm. But it's the thing that I, I always, always wonder about <laughs> potentially getting buffed out when people are trying to like box these communities into a specific like platform or piece of software. Yeah. Right. And there's also the dynamic too, right? Of like, um, that person's a shithead online. You meet them in person and then they're no longer a shithead online to you. Totally. Right. Um, right. You might come to understand their totally. sense of humor or something like that. Right. Like you suddenly gain a lot more context. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about like how those both feed into each other. I'm curious about like, has anyone here had like a purely online relationship, friendship with someone and like, what was it like when you met them in person? And... Mm. Does, uh, does like calls count? Cause I think that's, you know, I, I've met like a few people online and then when I met them in person, it was like, oh, but I have one friend, I'm giving a shout out to Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Jake Orthwine, I always what tell him, you? <laughs> you know who you are, um, you know who you are. Um, I always tell him because he was like quite active on Twitter and I was like, oh, sometimes people who are so active on Twitter, like they're, you know, there's a reason why they're on Twitter so much. Um, but then, you know, I had like a bunch of calls with him and I, we actually became like really good friends so much that like I invited him to Berlin during the summer and then now he's like dating one of my really good friends and they're super in love. So that was a, a good experience, but apart from that, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like anyone I'm friends with online um, has a sort of ghostly veneer to their, to my mental picture of them that isn't real or like the Newtonian fluid of their personality isn't real until I see them in person. And that happens at like urban assemblies, for example, so many Pat P's I've met and I'm like, oh, you're a real fucking human being. Mm. Like I knew that, but also I didn't know that. It wasn't real. You weren't real to me. And yeah. that feels like an important threshold of cro like threshold crossing. Yeah, it was funny when we started throwing like the like assembly conference about like three years ago, because I think one thing before that is like Urbit had this kind of like aura around it that I think made it pretty standoffish to people who like hadn't been able to infiltrate it, whether it was through some of the original text, the founder, or like just the technology itself. Um, and like once that event happened, people were really surprised at the first assembly by like how many just pretty like random culture side people, not necessarily technologists, but like just interested in the space showed up. 
and everyone meeting each other was like maybe the most wholesome time we've mm-hmm. ever seen. <laughs> seen. And like, yeah, it suddenly is, I think it like really destigmatized Urbit for a yeah. lot of people just being like, oh, you're here? I'm here too. Yeah. How do you think about that at Salon and like thinking about sort of software you've built that is sort of modular by nature, you have the ability to then form your own groups inside of groups, but you can also ultimately connect with other folks on the network. Like, what's your philosophy on how communities should be thinking about using software like what you build at Salon in order to maybe um, move past some of these like shitty issues that uh, have ruined Matt and I's lives? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think... Like, for example, there's this article that came out recently, I think it was like in the Atlantic or something, it was like, I missed the time where we were all online. And it was like, I'm, it was mourning basically the death of like the Facebook era, which I thought was hilarious because I thought we were kind of still in it. Um, but yeah, I don't think we were ever meant necessarily to like all be online, all in the same place, all at the same time. <coughs> I think when people have that like nostalgia for that like Facebook age or the Instagram age, usually it's like early adopters or it was like at a time where just it, like a relevant amount of your community had gotten on and that was kind of all you had exposure to. And so I think the thing we think about a lot at Talon is like, okay, how can you make a space for your community but also have the flexibility to move, migrate, morph, um, mm-hmm. So, like, we don't really think about groups that these are, like, permanent discords, right? Like, you can have any type of group. It could be, like, a group for your birthday GPT, <laughs> you know, hosted party. And it's just, like, it's only planning. It could be um, something for this event. It could be, you know, like, anything that's, that's temporal or casual or, you know... It's not meant to be like so precious and so rigid. Mm-hmm. And so I think like that's a lot of what we're working towards. Some of the technology, for example, that I really like, like I'm a big Rome research fan. And I like it because like I can just start out every day typing whatever and it somehow then gets structure just based on the technology. Mm-hmm. I love that that idea that like a community can just come in and act and suddenly the structure takes shape around them. Mm. Um, And so I think that's a lot about how we we think about it at Talon. That's really interesting. I could see AI being this bridge of the fuzziness of how communities actually want to interact and the technology that they utilize to do so. Um, Because the act of, I don't know, creating your online space is uh, one of boxing and constraining. Um, But if there's some sort of listener something that truly understood you know this person doesn't want to be in this group chat but like doesn't have to go click the leave button and like tell everyone else that they left that group chat like maybe there's a more human way to bridge that sort of like community technology gap with something like ai that can intuit uh, people's understandings definitely because like right now in it there's this kind of um inability to act by just like so many choices Mm -hmm. right like one thing that we do really well is we give you a lot of selection so like you can turn on and off notifications extremely granularly you can run your orbit wherever you want like but sometimes that's like uh yeah it's difficult to get started it's not an easy thing for everyone to get it Mm -hmm. all set up it's like we're asking people to build homes that like don't know what a hammer is you know Mm. totally Yeah. yeah yeah I was um, signing up for Discord because, or for a new Discord server, because I have to go mute all of the. Thi- I have to mute the entire server, but unmute the channels that I actually want to listen to. It's a lot of manual work. I don't know. It seems uh, it's a it's a friction point for sure. I know we need yeah. like the sim like rosebud cheap code so we can all <laughs> have a great time building out our social <laughs> mansions. Yeah. Um, okay, we're we're kind of like coming towards the end. I want to see if anyone in the audience has a questions about, you know, the intersection of community and technology for any of our panelists? No one? Someone. Someone in the back. back. (laughs) Make it good. How might we effectively construct local communities? Like, obviously, we've got very diverse groups of people, but (laughs) if everyone was using an urbit, like urbit saturation, how might we get people to 
rediscover locally. Rediscover what? Sorry. Locally. Ah, uh, yeah. 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 I think one thing that's super important is the onboarding process. When you think about like how people like uh, end up joining a community, like what was the onboarding? What are those like kind of membranes? Mm -hmm. um, like you'll notice, for example, in the Talon app right now, we've made it really easy for you to go in and just scan a QR code to send a DM. And it immediately facilitates that interaction of like, oh, now I'm connected one to one with you. And you can imagine that happening at scale and suddenly because you're connected to me, um, you might be able to see what groups I'm in. And you're like, oh, I like some of those groups. And then you can join some of that. So I think there's like natural ways of onboarding and then uh, discovery that can happen if you think like local first. Yeah, and, and I would add also like curating well the people who like come in first and making sure that they already have like some sort of like relationship or like affinity between them so that when a new person comes in, they can tell that the party is good. Mm. Yeah, I, um, the, that question is actually something that I'm obsessing over currently and it's, it's something that I plan to start working on um, at uh, sort of this uh, product company spinoff from FWB, which is like, we built this thing called Gatekeeper that I mentioned earlier, where you would RSVP to events based on what was in your wallet. Um, that is fun and interesting. It has been used for a ton of people to throw parties all over the world. But what I'm much more interested in is sort of like um, when you were saying, Matt, about like spatial things is um, less how do we connect you to something that mimics the idea of um, space in your device, but actually treat the space around you as input. And so um, ideas around things that you can only attend if you have the correct asset and then chats that you can only access if you're actually at that event, right? So like bringing back, I think in a positive sense, like the dark forest of socialization and mm -hmm. like not making everything just like I click into the thing and now I can see everything that's here inside of this community. Um, I recently became obsessed with like the history of text games and like MUDs and just like that journey of discovering a story and a narrative to me is actually what is most fun about socializing. And I don't think anyone's built anything that captures that feeling of like, you start off your journey, you don't know anyone in this scene, but you're like kind of interested in what it does. You meet that person who becomes your friend who takes you to like that next party where you make 10 more friends and like you get inspired to create something and contribute. That feeling of actually going from the outer concentric circle to the core is a thing that we've never quite been able to capture digitally, and uh, I'm going to uh, get rich or die trying to do that. <laughs> Social geocaching. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Nice. Yeah. But yeah, the real world is not one of perfect information, and all of our, you know, mm. you, you join channel, you have 50,000 fucking channels to see. That's uh, not necessarily accurate. It is different. Also, the shit shouldn't be easy. Like, I don't know. I'm a like gatekeeping is important to me. Like, totally. Protecting, yeah. protecting certain layers of information until people are like ready and and have like proven that they're worthy is a thing that again we've lost because of the blitz to like erect these monoliths that attract enough attention to sell ads against and like the whole bullshit of like a creator economy. It's like, that's not mm -hmm. how people should actually engage with cultural production in my yeah, opinion. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great question. All right. Thank, yeah, thank you, Perth man. <laughs> we are hoping you'd ask a question. <laughs> so my question is about multiple personalities. Um, essentially, and I, and I think this becomes more acute even in Gen Z than in the millennials, we're, we're maintaining not just one person online who interacts with a community or with multiple communities. We're, inter we're, you know, we're maintaining several personas that interact with several communities. And can you talk a little bit about like, what does it look like to manage contextually, um, like what it looks like to be and present yourself as several people online? Mm. Not in a you know sock puppeting or unethical way, but like totally. de facto, this is what we do. Yeah, yeah. Situational identity is like a massive part of how we act. You don't talk to your mother the same way you talk to your boss. It's just, and you switch so quickly and fluidly. It's you don't even perceive that you're a different person, and yet, like personality-wise, you totally are. And I guess what it is with technology is because of the protocolization, I have. 
three different Twitter accounts. Mm. Is that an accurate map of what I want to do? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I have a Finsta, I have a Rinsta, I have, you know, whatever, three different Urbit ships. Um, personally, I find that exhausting. I find that, that explicit differentiation, like, extremely exhausting. Um, and so, like, all of my anons that I've started, I've given up on. Fuck it, I'm just one person, whatever. Um, but that's just me. I, I have that sort of, I can't split my identity so clearly and strongly. But maybe it doesn't need to be that way. Maybe it could be fuzzier. Yeah. It would be so fun to, to think of like a, a way for there to be a platform where you could have a single account that represents your access to that platform. Mm -hmm but some sort of command that was simple enough to invoke that would allow you to represent yourself differently that day, like based on who you're trying to be, mm -hmm. and sort of collapse that behavior, which again is supernatural, um, into like a simple mechanic that allows you to decide, like today I'm like Psycho Matt, today I'm like Super Chill Matt, today I'm like gonna talk about ramen, like whatever, whatever ways in which you want to kind of like signal out to the group that this is how you're seeking to be engaged mm -hmm. with. Um, the same thing is like, I don't know, like people who maybe like dr are very uh, influenced by their emotions in the way that they dress and like choose to like, I'm going to go hang out with my goth friends. I'm going to totally. go hang out with like, yes. my, like yes. my family at church. And like you yes. might dress yourself differently. Totally. Like you said, you're going to treat yourself in a different way. You're going to project differently when you go to those spaces. Again, that's another thing that I think... Totally. I don't think it's impossible to do this stuff. I just, again, I'm being an asshole, but I think the people who build these platforms, like don't have enough of a rich social life to start to think about these things in a way that allows it to influence the things that they build. Yeah, yeah. At, at Talon, we thought a bit about this. Ed and I were ideating, and we, we kind of thought about it like outfits, right? Because like, you're not ever necessarily not you walking in, but like you are some variation of you. And so yeah. like, how can you have that? And like, totally. You you have kind of like a set amount of outfits or like arrangements and whatnot. So I don't think it's as like, large of a problem maybe as we see, but it is definitely a problem to navigate. The other way I've personally dealt with it is not the best way, is like I just have pretty much no personal traces online, which allows me to be whatever any given day because there's no previous context. <laughs> yeah, yeah. W w walking up here when someone said to me after you introduced me to them, like, oh, I know you're from your online presence, that was terrifying. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I also think that this sort of kind of like identity problem is a bit of um, like a problem that's like lagging from web two and like the idea of like having a personal brand and a personal identity that you're like supposed to market and like that's your biggest asset in a way mm. and, and that like it needs to be super polished and it needs to be not just like super polished but it needs to be like super um, concrete direct targeting to a particular audience and a particular niche. Mm -hmm. And that just, it's not how people are. Mm. Like people are fluid and they're multidimensional and they, they have so many facets of themselves. Like any interesting person has that. And I think because like trying to kind of like always maintain this persona, it's sort of like it has paid off in, in the era of like influencers and creators and so on, but it's exhausting. Mm. And I think culturally we're slowly moving past that like paradigm and so you see more people kind of like trying to be anonymous or just like having like their name and just being themselves. Yeah. So I think it, it's, it's, we're not quite there yet, but I think that's where the trend is going. Yeah. Uh, corporations may be considered humans, but like humans are not corporations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no matter how hard we try, <laughs> eventually we're gonna be like, nah. I'm a businessman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I I really like the cultural change that does seem to be happening. Right. Yeah. You had you know Web two one account things, and then like after years of that, you get like an account switcher on the side after people are already backdooring your identity yeah. system and having three separate Twitter accounts for their hyper-specific hobbies, mm -hmm. right? Um, and only now are we getting like crypto anons, like people have eight different fucking personalities. Exactly. But like from an informational perspective, how, how, how what, what compression has just occurred from like me and outfit, the context I'm in, the people I'm with, to eight different accounts on Twitter, even yeah. eight is so many, but all so few, right? It's, it's, it's a very interesting, dilemma mm -hmm. yeah gaming at least lets you kind of choose your player you know mm -hmm. yeah. social accounts don't really yeah. allow you to do that each time you want to play a global internet reset every day at zero utc <laughs> everyone gets a new star 
<laughs> Honestly, yeah, like yeah, no we're, we're missing system. diurnal cycles <laughs> in the internet. Um, did we have one more question? Otherwise, I have a closing question. Yeah, there's Soft someone question. there. Yeah. Okay. What leads right. to the most valuable Sorry. Yeah, I was going to repeat the yeah, question yeah. too. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> what leads to the most valuable communities? Great people. Mm. I mean, basically. And then there's like many like mechanisms and like techniques and, you know, like containers that you can do to kind of like empower and, and attract great people. But like ultimately is, you know, who's hanging out there. I think it's trust in the other people who are building this thing with you and the sort of um, ego dissolution required <coughs> to trust that what they want to do is also good and also fine. And like there's no right answer to whatever the hell it is you're building or creating or whatever your community is. There's no right answer. There's no right direction. There's just vibes and each person has these vibes. But I think one of the most important things is that ego distancing, that is, uh, acceptance that your one's opinion is unique and important and so fucking important and incredible, but also it's not everyone's, it's not all of it. And there's this sort of duality that needs to occur where you have to, one must feel confident and good as an individual within a group and also feel themselves as the group, even if the collective consciousness is not identically theirs. Yeah. Um, and I think people who come to group building with that trust and um, yeah, just trust in the other people that whatever it is, love and connection that makes them want to build something with them, uh, trust that wherever they end up is correct. And in that way, you know, allow others to push and pull that collective consciousness in different directions. And I think that that is what makes them survive. <clears throat> um, I think great communities that achieve a, a sense of having like a true value are a function of um, forcing the hand of chance. And it's like people who are willing to uh, enter into a scenario where they know that they want to create something, but aren't sure what that something is and are open about who gets to contribute to that. Mm. Um, I think that most communities who like don't achieve like a sense of either internal value for their members or external value from other observers are the ones that try to be too focused on like, this is our mission, this is our vision, this is what we're doing. Um, and I think the things that work best are those that are like predicated upon a openness to whatever happens with some loose ideas around what you'd like to see happen. And I think that um, that's tough for a lot of people these days. It's really tough. I think yeah. that like, We've, we've lapsed into this culture where everything has a fucking plan, like, and everything has to have metrics and KPIs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's something that, quite frankly, like, in FWB, there's, there's a contingent of folks who, um, like, have management consultant energy who are constantly mm. demanding KPIs, and it's like, yeah. have you, you ever you... gone to a fucking club and just chilled or no? <laughs> How do you KPI what the are, vibes? Uh, yeah. What are club KPIs? No, I, yeah, no, these are all great answers. I think the other thing that's come up through this this um, panel is just the need for some way for the community to see itself, mm -hmm. right? You need that kind of like check-in, that kind of feedback system. Otherwise, right, you end up in this kind of like atomized place where like communities fall apart and that, that might be IRL or maybe we'll have figured out yeah. some other way that technology can help facilitate that, whether it's an AI tool, et cetera. But definitely, yeah, the importance of self-reflection or community reflection. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure we have time for one more question, but we can try. We do. Can we try? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you Go for it. Go yeah. for it. If there were two things, two changes you guys could implement in your communities, what would it be and why? Mm. Two changes we would implement in our communities and why? In our communities. Let's see, in a magic wand. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Wow. Talon's, we're, we're like a platform, not so much a community, <laughs> so you tell me. <laughs> it's basically how, how I'd answer that. Yeah. I think for PleaserDAO, we were talking about the financialization overhead. I think that that's a, you know, it, it both is what it is and is, uh, it's undivorceable and yet also kind of an issue. Um, so... <laughs> 
I would need a very magic wand to fix that, but um, that's what I would do. Yeah, I think for, for me, for us, it would be the ability to like gather IRL more often. We're still kind of like spread out, you know, some people in Europe, New York, SF, all over. And even though we do see each other kind of like semi regularly to have like everyone gather and like really share like quality time, like for say, ideally like two weeks, you know, you have a residency, we're, we're trying to do that. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that is really kind of where the most precious community building, bonding, and create, creation time happens. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> <laughs> this is an interesting question to ask of FWB. I, I would say that, uh, shit. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would change the way that it was run for the past like year and a half. I think we made a lot of like operational mistakes due to people with like, very little experience running things, running things. Mm -hmm. And then I would also, there's like seven to 10 people that I would just like, maybe not fully ban, like maybe, <laughs> maybe I would like heaven Actually, ban them. So like they're in a, a simulated version of the community where they're talking to fucking bots all day. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, there's like better management and like remove some so, like soft exit. weirdos. Yes. Like, exactly. Mm, totally. Yeah. yeah. All right. better, better parallels for soft exit, because, yeah, some people can, can be bad online. Yeah, and no <laughs> one wants a hard exit. That's, people go kicking and screaming. Soft exit is quite nice. Um, okay, one word answer. Is the internet over? Mm, it's on the beginning. It's beginning. What? It's on the beginning. Okay. It's on the beginning. I think it'll never go away, but we have to use the thing to do what we want. And uh, for me, apparently, I didn't believe this. I didn't realize I believe this as much as I do, but I just want to do IRL shit. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, the internet never happened in the first place. <laughs> you heard it here first. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.